So uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, ESS Professor Claudia Simzik. Claudia received her undergraduate and graduate education in Germany with a diploma in geoecology at the University of Beirut and a doctorate at the Max Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry and Frederick Schiller University in Jena. Uh, Claudia was then hired by UCI as a researcher and she's been on the ESS faculty since 2011. She's known uh, for both her outstanding research and mentoring and she was awarded the prestigious American Geophysical Union Saltzman Award for excellence in education and mentoring in recognition of being an accomplished researcher and an, an excellent mentor and educator uh, to undergraduate, graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Much of her recent research has focused on the implications of the rapid changes in the Arctic. And I'm looking forward to hearing this, so I'll just turn it over now to you, Claudia. Thank you, Alex, and thank you all for coming today. So I know it's week 10, so I'll hope to make this entertainment and even the end of your quarter. So, um, as you heard, so my, my lab group works on the terrestrial part of the global carbon cycle, and we study a number of different compounds that influence the global carbon cycle and the earth system and climate, specifically CO2, methane, and aerosol. And I just wanna give you a quick overview of the three main areas that we'll work on. The first one involves emissions of fossil carbon. So fossil carbon are the main driver of climate change, at least during this century. And we have an amazing tool in the basement of ESS, which is a radiocarbon instrument. And we're hoping to extend this capability very soon. Radiocarbon is so fossil derived carbon that's um, emitted from anthropogenic activities is devoid of radiocarbon, which makes it really easy to trace in the global carbon cycle. And I wanted to show you this curve. This is by Heather Graven, came out of this last year. And it shows the radiocarbon content of atmospheric CO2 over time from the 1950s to into the future. And you can see that the Seuss effect related to the emissions of fossil carbon has now, together with the natural carbon cycle, eliminated the nuclear bomb signal from the atmosphere. And if you go forward, you can use the signal to understand both the emissions of radio for fossil carbon, but also our efforts to decarbonize our environment. So if we continue along the path of emitting as much fossil fuel as we can, we're gonna end up with an atmosphere where plants that are growing in the year 2100 may look like a 2000 years old. And this type of modeling the earth system requires a lot of observations of atmospheric CO2 and two of these Long-term observations are being maintained at Irvine by Shamei Shu, who's a tech staff scientist and a really important member of my research group. And she measures atmospheric CO2 radiocarbon at Point Barrow and also at UC Irvine. We've recently expanded this into using annual plants to look at the impact of the COVID shutdown in California on fossil fuel emissions in California and hope to continue this in the future to monitor and guide California and the world in its um, journey to decarbonization. The second aspect of my research group deals with aerosols and we have developed technology to partition aerosol into organic and black carbon, which have really different effects on the radiative budget of the atmosphere. And we can then use radiocarbon and other means to understand where these aerosols are coming from. And recent work by Blanca Rodriguez, who just defended the thesis this year, showed that um, black carbon in the Arctic is being um, intercepted as in um, alert in the high Arctic is mostly coming from fossil fuel emissions within the Arctic region. But today I want to talk about soil carbon. Soils are really amazing. They do so much for us, but they're also a big reservoir of carbon and they contain at least two to three times as much carbon as the atmosphere. And so changes in the amount of carbon stored in soils can have big impacts on atmospheric carbon and therefore climate. And a special part of the soil carbon pool is the permafrost region where we anticipate that there are an additional thousand to fifteen hundred petagrams of carbon stored in frozen soils. 
the permafrost region is rapidly changing. So permafrost covers about uh, 14 million square kilometers of the land. And it's divided into two different zones. We have here in purple, the continuous permafrost zone, which contains permafrost that formed mostly during the last glacial period and is really everywhere except large rivers and lakes. And then there's the discontinuous and the sporadic zones on the outside of the Arctic. And here permafrost is less common and it's younger. And surface properties are really important for the preservation of the existence of permafrost. And permafrost is a really complicated beast and it varies a lot in temperature. It can be really cold with less than 10 degrees Celsius and um, hundreds of meters thick to being almost at um, zero degrees Celsius and only a few meters thick in other parts of the Arctic. This Arctic region with the permafrost is warming rapidly and we've actually already surpassed two degree warming in the Arctic, which is the global threshold that we're hoping to avoid for the planet. In the last 40 years, we've seen a 0.6 degree warming in the Arctic and also an increase in precipitation. So with a warming Arctic and less sea ice, we're also seeing a moisture atmosphere and more uh, rain and snow. And this is affecting the permafrost. A uh, global network of borehole temperature um, networks is being maintained across the circumpolar region by um, that Romanovsky and other colleagues um, show us that permafrost is basically warming everywhere. So they have observations that go back at least into the 80s, 1980s, and in most locations, permafrost has been warming. This is the temperature at the, um, where the temperature amplitude every year doesn't change. So between 2007 and 2016, globally, um, permafrost is warmed by three degrees Celsius and in the continuous permafrost zone by 0.4 degrees. And we're expecting that by the end of the century, we will lose somewhere between two and 99% of all permafrost in terms of area. So this is potentially a huge problem, but it, as you can see, it's also really uncertain. And this has implications for climate because of the carbon that's stored in permafrost, but it has also really big implications for the Arctic and ecosystems and people in the Arctic. There's estimates that 70% of all Arctic infrastructure, houses, roads, and so on, is at risk of permafrost thaw and subsidence due to the presence of ground ice that is stored with carbon in the ground. The permafrost carbon feedback is very uncertain in terms of its magnitude, its timing, and its type of carbon emissions. The best estimates we have so far from a recent um, IPCC report on the ocean and cryosphere from 2019 shows that we're expecting the permafrost carbon feedback by the end of this century to be on the order of 2,400 gigatons of carbon, which is um, not much relative to fossil fuel emissions. It's more like the on the order of the land use feedback. And there's medium evidence and low agreement that it's already contributing to carbon emissions from the region, permafrost loss. Methane is expected to be a small proportion of the fluxes. This is a big change to earlier estimates, but it's still potentially contributing 50% of the radiative forcing from the Arctic. And there's medium evidence and low confidence on whether the level and timing of increased plant productivity and replenishment of soil carbon stocks will absorb some of these permafrost losses. So you can see that emissions are um, uncertain and vary in terms of their timing here, this estimate from 2015. Okay, so now I wanna tell you a little bit about um, what we've been doing in the last decade or so in the Arctic to better understand carbon cycling in the changing Arctic. The first one involves carbon cycling, what I call carbon cycling in the dark. And this has to do with the fact that most of our research to date has focused on the growing season, which is the summer. And in the Arctic, the summer can be two to four months long. So we're really missing most of the year. And um, new advances in measurement technology in terms of any flux powers, soil networks and so on, and, and increases in our understanding of microbial activity, which now show that microbes persist in glaciers, under glaciers, in frozen soils, and so on, have really pushed the boundary of this um, 
data and they have shown that winter and specifically fall and early winter emissions of carbon to the atmosphere are a significant part of the Arctic carbon budget. The study from Kamani et al. in 2017 showed that winter emissions are increasing. And this estimate from the Tali from 2019 on the right showed that the Arctic may already be a net carbon source to the atmosphere on an annual time scale due to increasing winter emissions. However, we're still kind of at the threshold to know whether the Arctic is currently neutral or a small thing. Okay. So in my research group, we can use um, a number of different tools to understand the drivers of these emissions. And we have been trying to build technology and push the boundaries to understand what fuels these fall and winter emissions specifically. And again, we use a lot of uh, radiocarbon to technology to do that. So the radiocarbon of ecosystem emissions is uh, a fun tool that allows you to estimate the age of emissions. And this is an estimate of trans time. So it tells you how much carbon, is, uh, how much time the carbon spends in the system and the age of when it's emitted back to the atmosphere. And it can also be used to study emissions of ancient permafrost carbon. And at the same time, it allows you to petition ecosystem emissions into rhizosphere fluxes, so plant roots and um, microbes that exist in the rooting zone and distinguish those from other microbes that are decomposing organic matter and potentially permafrost. And in the Arctic, because the plants are so small, they usually fit in our chambers. So when we put a chamber on the ground, we're not just measuring soil respiration, but actually the ecosystem respiration. So in the past, this was done mostly with these uh, soil chambers, which circulate air through an infrared gas analyzer to measure CO2 fluxes. And we then capture the CO2 to do radiocarbon analysis. And we can also use gas wells, which are basically a tubing that we stick in the ground and we connect it to a capillary that restricts the flow rate and we capture the CO2 in these evacuated canisters. These samples, um, were taken about once a month, and each sample integrates about one to 24 hours. And most of the work has been done in the growing season. And then you end up with a record like this. So you have the age for the radiocarbon content of ecosystem emissions as a function of time. And we can identify three different types of carbon here. We have young carbon that was recently in the atmosphere. It was fixed from plants and then respired back to the air after 1950 because it's above this current value of atmospheric CO2. Below zero, we have carbon that's been in soils for hundreds of years, and occasionally we capture carbon that's been in the ground for thousands of years. That is potentially the permafrost carbon. And so what we've been doing is to take um, ecosystem respiration home. We capture it in the chambers, on molecular sift traps or in canisters. And then we do two more things. We take the record of ambient CO2, which then for us represents the radiocarbon signature of plants. We can also do root, root incubations to confirm this. And we can take soils home and incubate them and measure the age of the emissions. And then we can do a simple, um, mixing model, we say the radiocarbon signature of the net emissions in the field are made up of emissions from the rhizosphere and emissions from microbes in the lab. And, the, and then we can solve this to understand the proportion of microbial emissions. And so I have a little estimate here on the right. You can see that the, um, the idea is that ecosystem respiration is somewhere here, and then somewhere else we have the radiocarbon signature of the plants or the rhizosphere and the microbes. And the closer the net emission is to any of these sources, the more the greater contribution comes from a given source. And this worked really well in the temperate zone, and it worked really well in the boreal zone in the subarctic. However, then we went to Greenland. And things didn't work out quite so well. So these are some colleagues of mine studying ecosystem respiration and striped soil in Northwestern Greenland. And here's the data. So this was from June through September. And you can see the age of emissions here from either these bare ridges or vegetated troughs. And if we now look at the radiocarbon signature of plants, which is given in, in this blue line here, the atmosphere, and emissions 
that we captured in the lab, you see that what we actually collect in the field is way off. So the ecosystem respiration doesn't fall between these two end members. And this has been um, difficult to understand and deal with for, for this technique. And one reason that it doesn't work so well is that Arctic soils are what we call cryoturbated. So there's a lot of spatial variability. You go out, the ecosystem looks somewhat simple. It's only so many plants and so on. And then you start to dig and you realize that the low ground, the ecosystem is actually really diverse in terms of sources. So my colleague, Jennifer Howard, was working on this trench that they dug through this striped landscape. And they found that the troughs, which only cover 10% of the area, contain 50% of the landscape carbon with uh, carbon that ages, ranges in age from 70 to about 2000 years. Then you have a bunch of unconsolidated sediment, which is not even really a soil, that's very um, poor in carbon. And you have these pockets of material that can be near the surface or at greater depth. And they contain a significant portion of the landscape carbon and they're really old. So it's possible that when we took the soil cores home to do the incubations, we didn't capture all of the potential microbial carbon sources available that we were able to capture in our chamber. Another option is that microbes actually use other carbon sources than what we capture in our incubations. That is, um, so even if you take the right soil core home, you might not describing it right. And part of this might be that the periods of incubations are too short or that we cut the microbes off from all the sources that actually are available in the field because it's really a continuum from plants to microbes to these heterotrophic microbes. So to kind of capture or deal with the large variability to keep the microbes more in their natural environment and to cover the winter gap, we build a new sampler that Sean had drawn. Um, hopefully you've seen, of, many of you have seen this talk last week, presented during his defense. So we built this during his PhD. And um, we installed these new samplers in the continuous permafrost zone in Northern Alaska in an ecosystem known as tussock sedge dwarf shrub moss tundra or moist acidic tussock tundra. And this ecosystem here in yellow covers a significant portion of Alaska's North Slope and also the Boma Beringer. And these samplers were co-deployed with CO2 and soil moisture and temperature sensors to capture CO2 in situ year round as it evolves in soil. Here's a picture of this new sampler. And it basically consists of a permanent gas inlet that has a silicone tubing that gas diffuses into and an exchangeable trap that we bring back to the lab. And here CO2 passively diffuses into the sampler onto the molecular sieve. And we integrate the sample over many weeks or months and then um, get really a fully integrated sample year round. We can absorb it in the lab by heating up these traps. First, I wanna show you what the soil looked like during this um, time period. So what really surprised us was that well, what we expected was the soil warms up in the, in the summer. So it's the soil temperature from the top of the soil going down into the active layer. You can see it's warm and thawed in the summer, and then it starts to freeze. But this white area here indicates um, parts of the soil that are about zero degrees Celsius. And what you can see here as a function of time is that the soil doesn't actually freeze till January. And this has been a recurring observation in many field sites. So it's all becoming warmer, even though the air temperature is below freezing in the beginning of September, the soil doesn't freeze till January. And during this time period, there's significant microbial activity. And under the snowpack and in this warmer soil, you can see CO2 building up and then being ventilated during freeze thaw events in the soil and out of the soil. We also took the soil home and incubated it at different temperature from freezing to room temperature. And then instead of telling the microbes what to eat, because we know this doesn't work so well in the Arctic, we combined the flux data that we got in the lab with temperature and moisture information in the field 
at every depth throughout the year of a continuous record of soil conditions in the field to calculate the flux of microbial carbon emissions throughout the year. And we can then calculate um, a flux of microbial CO2 at the surface and compare it to a flux of ecosystem emissions throughout the year that we got in this case from a nearby variance tower. And this allows us to then partition the flux into microbial and plant carbon sources, so rhizosphere and microbial. And what we found was that the microbial emissions were the biggest part of the total flux during the growing season, in the middle of the growing season, when the soil is the deepest and the warmest. And then rhizosphere contribution were actually considerable in the fall, in the shoulder season, early, early fall, late summer. And then microbial contributions are important throughout the winter at lower rates. And um, this model, so doesn't tell the microbes what to do anymore, except they, they're restricted in terms of how much they can do. And this partitioning model is then extended to all depths. So the assumption is that what we see at the surface in terms of how much is coming from the rhizosphere versus the microbes, this assumption is valid for all depths. But mathematically, the correction actually gets smaller and smaller for deeper soils. So we ended up with a um, Okay, so we just ended up with um, an annual record of ecosystem respiration. So this is year from January through the end of the year. So at the year time from left to right, and from top to bottom, you can see soil depth. So um, this is what we measured in the field over two years, compiled into um, monthly time intervals and compiled into one year of model data. And the dots here indicate times when the soil isn't frozen. So we have measured the radiocarbon signature of ecosystem respiration. We know from our flux data and the temperature record what the contribution of microbial CO2 is at all times. And from that, we can calculate how much the contribution is from plants, the, the rest. <coughs> We know what the radiocarbon signature of the rhizosphere is, so we can solve for the radiocarbon signature of microbial emissions. And this is what you see here. So combining the temperature derived fluxes and the measured radiocarbon of the, the net respiration on the plants, we can calculate microbial emissions. And what you see is that um, the age of emission declines with steps as expected. <clears throat> And we have the oldest emissions in the middle of the summer when the soil is warmest and thawed the deepest. And in the fall, we see um, older carbon near the surface and at depth. <coughs> and in the winter, we see um, older carbon at depths again. And this was a much more dynamic picture than we expected. When you compare this to the radiocarbon profile that we get in incubation studies in the labs, you can see that the color scheme doesn't match. So we persistently pick up carbon sources at depths that are older than what we see in the incubation. And in the middle of the summer, again, like I mentioned earlier for Greenland, it could be that this older carbon is coming from deeper depths. But in the winter, it's not possible because the soil below these areas here is frozen solid. So what we think in, in, instead is that microbes have access to, uh, so during the summer, they have access to carbon sources where they are and they, have, they get CO2 and uh, sorry, DOC from other carbon sources with the soil water. And in the winter, they become locally isolated and they're stuck eating where they are. And so when you compare this, the steps profile of microbial respiration, you can actually see that it converts, converges on the radiocarbon profile of bulk soil carbon, which su suggests that they, they stuck eating local carbon sources in the winter. And we can um, study, so we have a much more dynamic range of microbial carbon emissions. <coughs> and we can also use the fluxes of CO2 at every depth and the fluxes of radiocarbon at every depth 
to calculate the, what the emissions at the surface look like. So in addition to calculating total emissions year round, we also now have a radiocarbon signature of an ecosystem year round. And what this allows us is that we can now compare the mean age of the transit time of carbon emitted from different landscape units within and across the Arctic for the first time. And we have a tool to directly measure permafrost carbon emissions, which are happening during the winter period. And we're planning to do, continue doing this at Tuli Field Station, which has a year on staff to help us do this and integrate more samplers into existing networks of CO2 emissions. The other thing that we learned here is that, again, the non-growing season of fall and winter are a critical time period for permafrost carbon losses, where we have predominantly older carbon being emitted into the modern atmosphere, and these emissions are increasing over time with warming. And we see that microbes have access to a greater variety of carbon sources than we anticipated. And we can model their activity and their emissions based on temperature and other soil data we don't need to tell them what to eat in terms of ages. And I think in the future, we need to combine our gas measurements with those of VOC and the permafrost microbiome to really understand the role of these temporarily available carbon pools for microbes and soil emissions. This work on the land, on the dry land, complements efforts by another grad student, Clayton Elder, who was uh, recently graduated from UCI, um, that worked on lakes because a large proportion of the high Arctic is actually covered in lakes. And so, and his work showed that lake emission ranged from modern to about 3,000 years, dominated by CO2, and are related to the age of the carbon or the landscape type that the, the lakes reside in. So, we now have a tool to measure carbon emission ages year-round from both lakes and the land surface. And we can really start building regional radiocarbon inventories of emissions. Okay, so I want to take a step back and talk about what permafrost carbon actually is. So permafrost soils have what we call an active layer. So this is the surface of the soil, and here is the deeper part. And this line here describes the mean annual ground temperature. And you can see that the soil thaws at the surface in the summer and uh, freezes up in the winter. And this active layer is seasonal, seasonally thawed. Okay? And then there's permafrost underneath. And in the permafrost region, we have about this 1,000 petagrams of carbon. And a lot of it is near the surface, but the largest part is actually at greater depth, currently frozen. So right now, we're kind of just looking at emissions of active layer carbon. In the future, we're expecting emissions of the permafrost carbon pool at depth. So a number of different studies have tried to understand what this looks like. This is a study from Bo Elbeling in 2013, where they compared a heat system here on the slope to a wet sedge system um, downslope. And they took soil samples in 1996 and 2008 and monitored the active layer development, which increased by over a centimeter per year. And they incubated soil samples for many years, and then showed that with active layer development, you have more carbon available in the soil profile. But, and then a huge amount of this can be lost if the soil conditions remain dry, aerobic, but only a small percentage of the carbon is emitted if the soil becomes flooded after thawing. So it's really important for carbon emissions in the future. We have shown this in another study as well that I was involved in, um, whether the soils are draining or not, because the uh, excellent mechanism to preserve stuff in your freezer is when you leave the door open is to flood it. You might not want to eat it anymore, but it, it won't spoil as fast as if it was dry. Another study um, tried something similar. They took soil cores home from the field and large chunks of soil, mesocosms, and they thawed them one centimeter at a time from the top of the soil into the permafrost. And they found huge emissions of N2O where they reached the permafrost. And um, what's been puzzling me for the last few years, and I don't have the right answer for this part of the talk yet, but I thought I'd share it, is that these studies rely on measurements of active layer. And active layer measurements 
and then the permafrost underneath are actually really difficult. So this is a record of active layer measurements in August from Tule Field Station in this moist acidic tussock tundra. And you can see that the measurements actually vary tremendously in the field from one location to the next. And they vary a lot from year to year. And in this location, we're fortunate enough to have 30 years of this data. And you, we have compiled it into one growing season, basically. So you can see that the soils start thawing in May and they reach maximum thaw in August and then they start freezing up. And then here the record ends because everybody goes home. And you can calculate different things with this. One is the mean depth of the active layer, which is about here. So this range here is the active layer as you would measure it in the field. But you can also see the maximum depth of the active layer, which is actually twice as deep. And this is an extreme case maybe because um, tussock tundra has this tussock sedge that actually sticks out of the um, snow in the spring. This is a picture from the fall, but in the spring it's even more intense when you have permanent sunshine on this. So the, the tussock uh, hummocks thaw out much faster than the swales in between. And you get this really deep active layer in the summer and then it freezes back up. So we have an active layer and permafrost, but we have this long transition zone in here. And you can imagine like one year, water, carbon, and microbes and nitrogen can go to here, and then they're stuck on the permafrost table. The next year they, they go deeper. So you have stuff that freezes and thaws every year, and you have an area that freezes and thaws every five years, every 10 years, and so on. So this is an amazingly carbon, nitrogen, and microbe rich rich area of the soil. So when we look at this with radiocarbon of the bulk soil, we actually see that the age of this material is a big mass in the top of the soil related to cryoturbation. And then it's very stable at the bottom, at the lower meter, which suggests that this is the actual permafrost carbon that hasn't been in contact with the atmosphere for thousands of years. And then in between, we have this transition zone where you have almost a one-to-one -one mixing of modern carbon into this old carbon pool. And most of our studies to date have really just looked at this change from the active layer into this deeper transition zone. And so um, we've tried to see if this area that we expect to be rich in carbon and nitrogen microbes actually um, will emit a larger pulse of CO2 and NGO and other things than the permafrost itself. And this is a, a data set that's not fully supporting my work hypothesis yet, but it's also only based on a very limited number of cores, N of two. So you can see maybe an increase on CO2 emissions here that may be sustained or not. You can see a slight decline in NGO, and I really want to continue this work to answer this question. So what we found was that you can use measurements of bulk 14C to determine the long-term position of the permafrost table, which comes in handy when you don't have 30 years of thaw depth available or a borehole temperature observation. And also that I'd like encourage the community to think of the active layers as zones rather than a line. So um, the best uh, picture that I'd like to come up with is maybe the San Andreas Fault. We all know a picture of the San Andreas Fault that looks like this. It's just a line on, on the map. And when you actually go to the field and drive a little inland, the zone, this, this, this line here is actually a zone that's hundreds of feet to a mile wide. And so we need to think of the active layer not as a line, but as a, as a zone. And this is a challenge for people that are generally trained in the temperate zone with soil books, soil um, knowledge that is mostly developed in the temperate zone. And they spend, if they're lucky, maybe a couple of years in the field doing these measurements of thaw depth. So I think that um, there's a slight risk that permafrost carbon and nitrogen emissions as they are in all of our models to date, based on both lab and field studies may not completely accurately reflect the longer term emissions. And that we need to de dig deeper and separate this transition zone that might generate a pulse of emissions from a sustained permafrost signal. And now uh, I want to 
Let's give you a quick run through a number of experiments that we've worked on in the Arctic and then have, have a couple of conclusions. Okay. So we have worked on a number of different snow fence experiments. This is a fun experiment where you build a fence and it brings in a snow drift behind it. And you are basically conducting a winter warming experiment and or water addition in the, in the spring. And these experiments were easy to do, had big effects, but they were considered not being very realistic because we can see in the set satellite records that snow cover extent is actually decreasing. So they say, okay, we do all these. We have all these experiments looking at increasing snow, but in fact, we're actually seeing less snow in the Arctic. And it turns out that um, actually in many parts, especially the North American Arctic, we're seeing an increase in snow pack depth. We're seeing a, um, a decrease in the snow cover period, the time that's covered in snow, but then actually seeing an increase in the amount of snow on the landscape. So this recent work here, the Manavia Creek showed that um, snow gauges actually undersample snow and that these long-term measurements of snow on the ground suggest more snow. So these experiments might be more realistic for the near future than we expected. Um, Sean has shown in his work that with snow addition, we see tremendous changes in the type of carbon that's being respired from the soil. You can see that compared to the ambient climate, carbon is much older in the emission signal. So we have much greater emissions of ancient carbon coming out of the ground. And at depths, this carbon is 6,000 years old on average, which might be the oldest carbon emit emissions that were measured so far. And this is related to a 15 degree increase in soil temperature under the additional snow. We've also seen a, a deepening of the active layer in this experiment and um, a shift in radiocarbon of the bulk soil, which suggests that the whole soil profile was compressed by the additional snow on top and also the subsidence from the melting of ground ice. And even though we have greater emissions of ancient carbon here, we actually see a tremendous increase in both the carbon in the, in the ground, but also the nitrogen, which suggests. Um, both that we're mixing the deeper soil carbon, which was made in a nitrogen richer environment into the active layer, and we have more decomposition within the active layer. So we have really big changes in both the carbon and nitrogen cycle. We've also uh, studied lakes in the changing Arctic. And this one shows that uh, in contrast to lakes that are being relatively large sources of relatively modern or young carbon in the high Arctic, lakes in the, in the further south that are actively expanding through thermal costs actually emit older methane and CO2. And the age of emissions is related to their rate of expansion. And then the last experiment that I'd like to show you is from a wetting and warming experiment in the high Arctic. So most Arctic research so far is kind of focused on the lower parts of the Arctic. And the high Arctic is important because it's warming at the greatest range. It's really a marine ecosystem. It's very close to sea ice, which is disappearing. So here we have 20 years of warming and water additions during the summer. And we found that all different treatments increase ecosystem respiration. And there was tremendous differences from year to year, which really called for long-term observation. And we found that most emissions were relatively young, um, except when it was much warmer. So in this very dry and warm year, we see older emissions. And um, we were lucky enough to observe a very, very wet year. And again, we found that um, very, old, very wet conditions tend to preserve all the carbon at depth. So we're thinking again that um, changes in soil hydrology can basically shift the, preser the preservation mechanisms for soil carbon from frozen to flooded to, to anaerobic, and that will really slow down the decomposition of permafrost carbon. This experiment also found that greater water addition, in particular with or without warming, allowed much more plant growth. So plants grew significantly larger during this experiment with many more leaves. 
we saw in, in one order of magnitude increase in carbon uptake in the ecosystem. So the northernmost part of the Arctic is actually greening in response to this um, warming and wetting, in particular wetting signal from climate change. I mean, we recently harvested this experiment after 20 years. And um, while still working on the data, we see an increase in soil carbon here in this wetting treatment that supports our flux measurements, which is really encouraging because this was only in the summer and this is a year round signal. Okay, and then uh, this experiment had additional data that we never published yet, but um, becomes more important within the community. So we have focused mostly on emissions of methane and CO2, but a lot of these ecosystems are actually big sinks for methane. So this experiment, we found that the vegetative tundra is a relatively large sink for methane, while these bare areas are relatively neutral when it comes to methane. And we also found that methane uptake is mostly controlled by soil moisture rather than temperature, which is currently assumed to be. And we think that this is a high soil moisture. Methane uptake is limited through the ability of methane to diffuse into the ground and at very low soil moisture, the microbes become limited. So I wanna leave you with a couple of thoughts at the end. One is that we've worked at all these snow fence experiments and in addition to changing fluxes, they have actually big implications for vegetation cover. This uh, snow fence experiment in Alaska has turned the area right next to the snow fence where we have the biggest increase in snow into a wet thatch tundra. It all started as a tundra. It's basically a wetland now. And then this area with intermediate snow deposition has turned into a shrub tundra with meter tall shrubs. And this is really puzzling because you're on a slope. So the fact that you have very limited hydraulic conductivity in the landscape allows for the existence of a lake on a hill, which is not really realistic in the greater future when we're expecting much greater thaw and connectivity in the landscape. So I think that making progress on the permafrost carbon feedback in the Arctic really requires a landscape approach that brings together people that are focused on upland tundra and lakes and water bodies. And that accounts for this increase in connectivity in the landscape through the soil and along the, uh, along the gradients. And I think that the, the biggest uncertainties right now are related to the change in uh, methane uptake and carbon emissions from upland tundra and emissions or uptake of carbon from disappearing lakes, which is really understudied. And we also need to take into account that water and vegetation cover much more strongly impact soil properties in the discontinuous permafrost zone than in the continuous permafrost zone. Basically, if you're far enough north in a cold climate, you can do whatever you want to the surface, you're going to have permafrost. But as you move further south, hydrology and vegetation cover, shading, water used by vegetation, and so on, really impact soil properties. And this is going to be a big driver of how fast permafrost will thaw and how much carbon can be retained in the ground. And we just started to, to scratch the surface when it comes to these questions. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with as a department is that to further strengthen the role of radiocarbon, which I think I showed you um, has a lot of interesting opportunities for carbon cycle work in the Arctic, to really make it more useful, we need to come up um, with a better concept. And I'd like to develop this with, with you in the department. Um, we need to better understand at what point old carbon emissions really matter for climate, how strongly. So at which age of carbon emissions does, does it indicate that we're losing permafrost carbon or that the system is out of steady state? And one way to think about it may be with this concept here, where we have the age of carbon on the X axis and global warming potential on the Y axis comparing CO2 and methane. And we could think about at what age a, a CO2 molecule in a global climate impact 
is equivalent to a modern method. And I think that would be really helpful to further integrate this amazing tool into the carbon cycle and climate research. And none of this work would be possible without amazing people. So I just like to acknowledge that we're um, doing this work on the landscape that was um, for thousands of years inhabited by native people. And it's a big effort that brings together the radiocarbon lab and lots of colleagues at UCI and across the world in the Arctic. Most of this work was funded by NSF and some of the Hellman Foundation. And it really requires enormous logistics. And if there's undergrad here listening, I'd like to point out that there's really great opportunity to become involved in science support as well, as science itself that can bring you to amazing locations around the world. And if you have time over the summer, I encourage you to check out um, Valerian Abenov and Joel Mollery, which have been my um, travel companions in the Arctic for a long time. They're really great uh, folks to share. So thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, see the, uh, the hands going up. And so I'll uh, go ahead and be starting on the top of my list here, uh, Francois. Oh, sorry, I was, I was just clapping my hands. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, these are clapping hands. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Okay. So I'm looking now for any raised hands. Or uh, you can type into the chat. And while, while we wait for those, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask one, Claudia, can, can you expand a little bit on, you know, what you're saying, why, why those shrubs were coming up in that intermediate zone? Do you think, is it, is it mostly water or uh, other things too, you think would likely cause the uh, shrubification there? So the, there's a temperature component. Um, so shrubs don't and, and also a, a physical rooting zone components or shrubs don't tolerate as much shredding of the rooting zone through perturbation. So you have more permanent conditions in the active layer under the deeper snow, which allows for shrub roots to survive. Okay. Um, recent work has also shown that shrubs can um, capitalize on uh, water earlier. So they use snow water in addition to soil water. So they start the growing season earlier when there's more snow water available. And shrubs are often coming in when you have a surface disturbance and, and um, warming. Okay, thanks. Any other uh, questions or comments for Claudia? Hey, Claudia. Can I follow up on your comments at the end about steady state? Because it seems like your radiocarbon measurements combined with the fluxes really do uh, make some indications about steady state, right? If you have really old radiocarbon, old carbon coming out at a high flux rate, that suggests that you are losing, you know, old permafrost and the system's not in steady state, probably perturbed by, by warming or other disturbance. So. I mean, how much, of, how much of that do you think is the rule now, given that these systems are experiencing perturbation? And are you seeing that, you know, are you confident you're seeing that in your incubation and your uh, field measurements of, of respiration? So the data that I showed is with, with an N of two right now. So for the first system where, where we developed the technology, we're not sure if the site has actually undergone active layer deepening. So what we're seeing in our control site might still be the mean age of carbon emissions from a relatively undisturbed public tundra system. And the snow fence were beyond that. We know it has been disturbed and we're losing carbon that was, in, that was fixed during the Pleistocene. But um, when you do the calculations of uh, how much impact that is on climate, we need to decide if it's your steady state 5,000 years ago when the Arctic was just about as warm as it is today, or is it a fundamental shift in the climate system, which was in the Pleistocene? So it, depending on where you set the age of permafrost carbon, your amount of emission changes 
And so I'd like to discuss this further to really understand of understand how it can be better integrate this H signal into the carbon cycle. Thank you. Okay, I think that's uh, that's it. There aren't any more. Uh, thank you again, Claudia. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending this and, and the other uh, uh, talks of this quarter. And uh, we'll be back at it again next fall. Okay. So thanks, Claudia. Thank you.